Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for tonight's virtual meeting on the upcoming winter MBTA service changes for 2021. My name is Angel Donahue Rodriguez, and I will be moderating tonight's meeting. First, the MBTA team has a presentation, and we ask you to please hold all your comments and questions until the end of the presentation. Second, we'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is being audio and visually recorded and will be made publicly available. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few meeting controls before we are, for those, for those of us who are not familiar with Zoom. Next slide. We have closed captions for this meeting. If you do not see the captions, please press the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen to get started. Next slide, please. If at any point during the meeting, we have any technical questions about this, about Zoom or the accessibility features of today's meeting, please chat tech support. We also offer, we will be offering Spanish interpretation during this meeting. In order to select, in order to select that, please select uh, either English or Spanish in audio in your meeting webinar controls. Click interpretation and then click the language you wish to hear. And you please wait for your Spanish interpreter to translate. Next slide. On today's call, we are joined by Melissa DeLay, Senior Director of Service Planning, and Kat Benish, Chief of Operations Strategy, Policy and Oversight. We'd also like to acknowledge any elected officials who may have joined us and their staff. Now I'd like to turn it over to Kat and Melissa. Kat, Melissa. Great, can you hear me, Angel? Yes. Excellent. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for taking time out of your evenings to join us for this conversation. Um, like Angel said, we'll give a brief presentation up front, giving both the context of the service change and then um, Melissa will be going into the detail of the service change and then opening up for Q&A and conversation. Uh, like Angel said, my name is Kat Benish. I'm the Chief of Operations Strategy, Policy and Oversight. Um, and Terry, I think you're driving so we can go to the next slide. So there's a lot here and I'll try to go piece by piece, but first and foremost, I want everyone to hear that no one in the authority or in any transit agency ever enjoys delivering a message of a service reduction. Um, it's something we always avoid at all costs, but I wanted to take some time to explain up first what we are doing and why before we get to the specifics. So fundamentally the change that will be effective December 19th is because we are facing a significant workforce shortage. Um, this is driven by national trends as well as some internal factors, but fundamentally, for those of you who are looking at um, school bus shortages or drivers, um, this I'm trying to say is throughout the nation, the region and local areas, everyone is facing a shortage of commercial driver's licenses, which is the key license that you need in order to be a bus operator. Um, this is the same shortage that led the National Guard to helping uh, provide transportation assistance to the Boston public school system earlier this year. And I say this to contrast very clearly, this is not a cost control measure. Um, the MBTA is fully budgeted to run a pre-COVID level of service across the board. We just don't have the operators we need right now to run it. And specifically, I'm talking about bus operators. Uh, Melissa will talk more, uh, but there are very few changes, if any, to rail outside of Mattapan. Um, and that's because, just for context, you, our bus operators require commercial driver's licenses. The, our individuals who drive trains do not. Um, so the reason we're making this change is we currently don't have the number of bus operators we need to deliver scheduled bus service this winter. Um, and are currently dropping one out of every 20 trips. And when we drop a trip, that means we don't run a trip. And I wanna take a second here to explain, I'm talking about scheduled bus service. So in the fall, so in September, when we put out our schedule cards, which are available in person and paper or online, 
that's essentially our promise to the public saying, here's the amount of service, the times, the places that we want to run bus service. Um, and currently, even right now, we currently are not meeting that promise. So like I said, one out of 20 trips are not running. Um, and what that means is even though we'd like to run that level of service, we can't. So to put some numbers behind it, for example, our fall bus schedule assumed that we would be able to provide or deliver about 93.5% of pre-COVID service hours. And in general, I try to reference pre-COVID service hours because I think it's a good rule of thumb or a good um, benchmark, even though service looks very different now than it did pre-COVID based on a lot of changing travel patterns, changing needs, et cetera. What we're proposing to run this winter is actually about 90.5% of pre-COVID service hours. So that represents a 3% reduction from fall to winter. And again, I'm talking about the scheduled service. So again, what's actually on the paper schedules or the digital schedules online. In comparison, currently today, and this isn't on the slide, um, on any given day in the fall right now, we're actually only able to deliver about 88, 89% of service. So we want to and strongly believe in what we call truth in advertising, that what we say we're gonna run on schedules is actually what we deliver on the streets because we know it's so important when you walk up to a bus stop that that bus comes that you're expecting to come and how important it is that bus comes when you're expecting it to come. So we're changing the schedule so that it's more reliable and predictable and reflects what we're actually able to deliver. So to say this another way, go to this third bullet point, we're gonna be basically rebalancing our bus service so that our scheduled service matches the level of reliable service we can deliver. And I'll elaborate more on what I mean by reliable service. But as we did these changes, we're still focusing on three key aspects. Um, and those have been consistent throughout the pandemic. The first is that we're trying to preserve access and quality of service for our transit critical riders. Two, make sure we're providing sufficient service for those riders returning to in-person school or work opportunities. And three, continuing to support new and changing travel patterns as the pandemic changes the way that all of us work, play, live. Um, importantly also, I wanna make sure very clear that this conversation and presentation is largely about what we're, our service change, but it's not the only effort the MBTA is undertaking. We are aggressively pursuing internal and external efforts to increase our workforce. And I'll speak to that briefly, but I say that just so you all know that that is ongoing and a major focus. And I think hiring is arguably the largest and probably the most important focus for the T right now uh, across the board, ensuring that we have the right number of people. Um, perfect, can we go to the next slide, Terry? So I'm gonna take a second to explain why it's so important that we have this truth in advertising. Um, so the service we plan to provide this fall is not the service we are running. So we're dropping trips, which again, we don't run them due to operator shortages. When we drop trips, this results in poor reliability and on even headways. And a headway is what we call space between buses. So how long you wait until a next bus shows up at your bus stop. I'm gonna skip the third bullet point, but actually talk about the graphic beneath if, if folks can see that. So the first row is a, um, essentially if you're waiting at a bus stop and you expect a bus to come, and we've told you on a schedule, this bus is coming every 10 minutes, you'll be standing at your bus stop. And if you sort of waited with a stopwatch, in an ideal world, you would see a bus coming every 10 minutes. However, when we drop trips, you could be waiting at that bus stop and if we drop a trip, you're now waiting 20 minutes. If we drop two trips in a row, you're now waiting 30 minutes. So you're waiting, it's very unpredictable when you come to a bus stop that we've told you is every 10 minutes, but it could be much longer than that. And that's, we know is incredibly frustrating for our riders. The alternative and what we're essentially doing is that second row. So with the resources that we have and the level of service we can deliver, instead we're saying in this example, we can't run a bus every 10 minutes, but we can run a bus every 12 minutes. And this time, because it's the schedule is built on the level of resources we have, we are more likely to be that when you're waiting at that bus stop, that bus will show up every 12 minutes thereabouts. So you might have to wait a little longer on average, but it's significantly less likely that you're waiting for 20, 30 minutes for a bus that should have showed up every 10 minutes. 
This is all really as important also for helping crowding and comfort. So if you imagine you're at that bus stop in that first example, and you're waiting for a bus that comes every 10 minutes, if it doesn't show up, more people have showed up at your bus stop. If it doesn't come again, more people are waiting at your bus stop. And by the time your bus does show up, you can imagine there's a lot more people trying to get on that one bus. And then you go to the next bus stop in the same situation. So changing the schedules to reflect what we can actually deliver is also really important from a crowding and comfort standpoint and makes the trip more enjoyable for everyone. So I realize, and I think this is helpful to highlight why it's so important we have this truth in advertising to make service more reliable and comfortable for everyone. Um, this is also a good example of, an example of the scale of what a 3% change could look like. In many cases, our changes are going from say, a 10 minute headway to a 12 minute headway, or a nine minute headway to a 10 minute headway. So we're talking generally in the order of scale of a few minutes, which I know is still a lot, but just to put some context on that. Next slide, Terry, please. Uh, also, as discussed, and like I said, we'll be focusing mostly on the service changes, um, but I did want to take a moment to recognize and help inform everyone on the number of um, efforts underway to increase HR capacity in hiring. So, for example, um, and this is not an exhaustive list, but really, like I said, it's a, a full court press of a number of things that are underway trying to improve our ability to hire across the organization. Um, so we've doubled the capacity of our HR department. Um, we've created a dedicated team specifically for operator hiring. We've brought on a third party uh, to help expand our hiring efforts and make it faster. We're undergoing a lot of efforts um, to streamline and improve the way we hire bus operators. So streamline the process, making it easier to apply, um, doing a lot also with the RMV. So like I said, having that commercials driver license is really important is it we see as a bottleneck. So offering to pay for the permits, um, holding what we call testing parties to encourage folks to come and trying to make it and lower the barriers of effort as much as possible to try to increase our numbers uh, of bus operators. And for comparison, in years past, uh, prior to the pandemic, we would sometimes and often have hundreds, if not thousands of people applying to be bus operators. So this is a very, very different environment. And again, this is not only the T, but I'm sure folks see in the New York Times and other newspapers around the US, this is a nationwide issue that we're all working through. Um, we've also, you may have seen, have an active advertising and marketing, marketing campaign, trying to encourage folks to apply. And if there's anything I could ask for folks to take away from this meeting is if you know anyone who's interested in coming to work at the T, um, it's, a, it's a great job, great uh, career progression and uh, great benefits. So we're always actively hiring across the board. Um, and also moving to the next bullets, I'm sure there'll be questions on this, but just to say we are also actively working with our unions and executive leadership on how we can make the bus operator job more appealing, um, thinking about things like pay, bonuses, et cetera, but all that is currently under an active collective bargaining agreement negotiation. So I won't speak to that in detail. And then finally, and this is one of the reasons where we don't have to reduce service as much is uh, we rely on both part-time and full-time bus operators we are promoting as many part-time bus operators as we can to full-time operators um, on a regular basis so that we can maximize the number of full-time operators we have. And every no additional full-time operator means they can work another 25% and get another 10 hours, um, which we think is more appealing for them as well as helps us provide more service. Um, so this is a number of efforts underway trying to help improve and increase our HR and hiring capacity. And I say this is we're doing everything we can uh, and are always open to more ideas for trying to improve bus operator hiring. So, actually, next slide, please. So in, in summary, and happy to answer any questions, uh, before I hand it off to Melissa, um, these changes essentially will, we're putting this winter, and again, predominantly these are service changes on the bus side, not. Uh, not on rail except for Mattapan. Um, we're optimizing service with our limited resources. We're trying to allow flexibility to make changes based on what we observe this winter. It will help inform what we do in the spring and summer. And overall, this change represents about 3% less bus service than pre-COVID. Um, thank you all for listening. At this point, I'm going to hand it off to Melissa DeLay.
Thank you, Kat. So on the next slides, I'll start to get into more detail about the mode specific changes. Next slide, please. First, we have subway. Next slide. Uh, in general, uh, this shows some ridership trends for the subway network from the past two months. It's been fairly stable at about 50% uh, of our typical pre-COVID levels, uh, slightly higher ridership on the blue line and a little bit less on the other lines. And then uh, you can also see a chart here that shows, uh, I'll call it sort of the typical weekday to weekend variation that we see. You see that sort of um, cyclical pattern. And then also the typical type of seasonal variation that we see. Uh, our ridership tends to be high in September and October. But in general, you can see it's been stable and not marked by the, the, the drastic changes that we've seen uh, in earlier in the COVID um, pandemic period. So on the next slide, I'll show you uh, what our plan changes are. Um, because it has sort of stabilized, um, next slide, please. Uh, we are having only very limited changes. So most subway lines, you're not going to be seeing any schedule changes. So uh, that's that's uh, a change. We've had many, many changes over the, the, the past uh, number of quarters. So uh, a little stability is refreshing, at least uh, on our end. Uh, on the mannequin side, there's there are two changes that are uh, planned. One of them, I'm going to call it a paper change that um, this is matching our uh, actual peak schedule to uh, what actually has been in place um, for a while now because uh, we've had some um, a number of vehicles that were involved in previous crashes that are not available for peak service. So we're actually reflecting that those vehicles are not there. So rather than saying that the trolleys are going to come every five minutes, we're reflecting the schedule to more accurately show that with the vehicles available, we're able to provide service every seven minutes. So I'll call this more of a truth in advertising because this is the level of service that people are experiencing now. Uh, and it's more of a paper bookkeeping change that the schedule is now reflecting that change. But uh, with the resources from that savings, uh, we're actually increasing the frequency of service uh, late at night on Saturday nights and um, on Sundays when sometimes service was every about 23 minutes uh, because there was only literally one trolley running back and forth online. Uh, we're making it so that at all times of day when there's service that there are at least two or more trolleys operating, which means that service will be every 13 minutes or better, um, even during the evenings on weekends. So uh, as a result of those changes, there are also slight uh, trip shifts uh, throughout the day, uh, seven days a week. Uh, we have schedules information available at mbta.com slash schedules slash subway. And I believe that all of our posts uh, our schedules for the winter schedule have now been posted alongside the fall schedule so that you can review uh, both the active schedules and the upcoming schedules as of today. Next slide, please. Uh, on the subway side, we also have some other improvements that we wanted to take advantage of this form to share with you. Uh, our fare transformation team has been busy. Uh, They've installed uh, new fare vending machines at all orange and blue line stations. Uh, these are really exciting. Um, they have the new tappable Charlie ticket. You can purchase Charlie cards at the machines. Uh, and th the intention is that this uh, sort of is the way to phase out the, the magnetic stripe insertable Charlie ticket. Uh, so uh, check them out. And then uh, we have a timeline here shown on the right side for uh, when we'll start rolling out those machines to red line, silver line, and green line. So more information about fare transformation you can find at mbta.com slash fares slash fare dash transformation. Next slide, please. On the bus side, we also have quite a few changes. Uh, you can see here, uh, we have bus ridership. It's actually higher than rail ridership, even though pre-COVID rail ridership 
uh, dominated. I think that reflects the uh, importance of the bus network to our folks who are make uh, our essential workers who are making trips. Uh, and uh, the next slide is also interesting. You can see uh, ridership uh, on the next slide. You can see the ridership by route. So even though overall the ridership trends are at about 60 to 70 percent of pre-COVID ridership, those trends uh, can really vary at the route level. Uh, some routes like the uh, 16 and the SL3, you can see are have very high uh, proportions of their pre-COVID ridership. You can see the 16 has 92 percent of its pre-COVID ridership or the SL3 has 88% um, of its pre-COVID ridership, whereas other routes that perhaps uh, are more, more likely to serve like the nine to five commuters or folks who have more access to remote or hybrid schedules uh, like the 73 or the SL2 have lower shares. Um, but overall, uh, ridership is strong. It's also just a, a, an interesting data point is the 28, which as you know, we have the free 28 pilot that's been running for the past few months. Uh, and that route um, between the fee free fares and the high percentage of uh, folks who are making those essential trips, uh, the 28 is at 94% of its pre-COVID ridership. Uh, so uh, on the next slide, I'll get into more detail on the types of changes that we have on the horizon. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the main strategy, as Kat mentioned, uh, a great many of these changes are because we're looking to reduce the scheduled frequency so that we can really match uh, our schedules to the current operator availability and reduce those long gaps from drop trips. At the same time, there are a few cases where we're able to increase some scheduled service where crowding is most severe and we have some other uh, restorations to accommodate uh, growing in-person school and work trips. And also note, many bus routes that see a reduction will still be running more service than we operated pre-COVID. Uh, you can go to mbta.com slash schedules slash bus to view the upcoming bus schedules. And again, uh, the fall and winter schedules have all been posted. So you can see the current and the upcoming schedules. These go into effect December 19th that is when our winter schedules take effect. Next slide, please. There's quite a few changes. Um, the full list of these is available at mbta.com slash service changes. I'm gonna talk about them in sort of buckets of changes um, because there are quite a few of them. Uh, first up, we have a number of routes with structure changes uh, in terms of where the routes are going. Uh, one of them, um, the 62 and 76, we're actually restoring uh, some peak period service uh, on those rather than the combined 62 slash 76 that have been operated on weekdays pretty much since COVID began. Uh, what that means is that there are some stretches, for example, Bedford Street in North Lexington and some other areas that we really had stranded riders and left them without any transit al alternatives within uh, over uh, over a third of a mile is the threshold that we've been looking at. So uh, it means that we're able to restore some of those services. Um, it does mean uh, there's a trade-off in terms of some of the frequencies that we're able to provide. Uh, but also uh, it means that for our 62 riders, uh, some folks traveling either out to Bedford or in from Bedford, quite a long trip on the combined routing. So during those times of day when uh, the peak periods, when ridership is highest, uh, we're able to provide folks with a more direct trip. Another structure change that we have is on the Route 111, one of the biggest uh, key bus routes in our system. Um, we're actually simplifying the route rather than having the short 111Cs to carry square uh, in combination with the full 111s out to Woodlawn, uh, we're actually gonna run everything as the full 111 to Woodlawn. Uh, we're hoping that this will help with some of the bunching that we see. One of the challenges when you have a long route and a short route um, on the operation side is that it 
difficult to keep the loads balanced. Uh, when they're starting in different locations, they might come together and often the short trips have fewer people and many empty seats and the long trips might be overcrowded. So we're actually hoping that this simplification will lead to more evenly balanced loads and a more comfortable experience for passengers. Uh, it also helped with uh, rider confusion. You know, sometimes uh, folks may board at Haymarket and uh, not realize which route that they're on uh, and may end up um, kind of taking the wrong bus uh, or getting crowded out of the bus that they wanted to get onto. So with this change, we think it'll make a much more legible, easy to understand route uh, for our customers. Uh, 116, 117 uh, are a sort of mini version of the 111. We had a few trips that were running a short version, the combined 116 slash 117, that uh, we'll be replacing those with more full 116 trips or 117 trips to again, try to um, simplify the route, but we, we didn't have as many of those trips to begin with as we did the 111C. So that's a much less pronounced change. Uh, other buckets of changes that we have on the horizon. Uh, there are a few cases where we have some frequency improvements uh, to the routes 19, 38, and SL1. Uh, 38 in particular, there's, there's one extremely crowded uh, school period trip uh, over to Latin that um, would often have in excess of 70 uh, passengers where we are looking to uh, add extra service to help relieve some of that crowding uh, and then some other uh, more minor frequency changes on the other routes. Uh, and then uh, in the next bucket, we have some routes that are a mixed bag. So they have some frequency reductions in parts of the day or for parts of the route, like on the 66. Uh, where, and then frequency improvements at other times of the day. Uh, or the 111, this is, um, depending on which part of the route, because of that structure change I talked about at the beginning, it means that there are some frequency improvements between Woodlawn and Cary Square, and then slight frequency reductions between Cary Square and Haymarket. But I do want to flag that the overall frequencies are still better than the service we had operated pre-COVID. The combination of uh, we'd added really a lot of service during COVID because this had some of the highest, more, most durable ridership. So we'd already added a lot of service. And actually with some of the um, travel time changes with the, uh, the bus lane on the Tobin, we'd also um, been able to squeeze out more trips. So even with the changes, um, it's still more service than we operated pre-COVID for the 111. Now, uh, the bulk of the routes on this slide uh, are all things that have reduced frequency. And I just want to flag that this is a change from many of our other foraging ahead changes. We're not talking about route, wholesale route eliminations this time. Um, we're talking about many small changes across the board to a lot of routes to get at this. So um, we're not talking about uh, the, the more dramatic changes. Uh, so these are routes with reduced frequencies. Uh, you can see the full list here. And again, this is also on our website at mbta.com slash service changes. Uh, but we have the route one, the seven, nine, 11, 15, and a number of other routes uh, that we have available on the slides here and on our website uh, that have reduced frequencies, but uh, there are no span changes uh, or uh, we're not changing the hours that the buses are running, just how frequently um, the buses are coming, you know, what that frequency, what that spacing between adjacent trips is. And then on the next slide, uh, we have one more bucket of changes to talk about, uh, and that's routes with minor trip shifts. And what that means uh, is that uh, we're updating schedules all of the time to reflect changing travel conditions. In the current round of schedules, there are a number of places where we had actually decreased the travel times because congestion pretty much had disappeared during COVID. And what we're finding is that congestion is growing. Uh, and in order to have better reliability and truth in advertising, uh, you know, the time it takes to get from point A to point B is different. 
So we're reflecting a lot of our schedules to reflect those new travel times that we've actually seen. So um, these are just saying it's going to take some of those trips are going to take a little longer and the actual times that they depart might shift a little earlier or a little later. But on the whole, the schedules are largely, largely the same. But I do just want to flag that these are the routes where you should definitely go to the website, make sure you're referencing the, the new schedules, if that's how you get your schedule information, or be sure to you know check a trip planner uh, or some of the real-time information, if that's how you prefer to get your information. But just know that the, the typical trip times are going to be uh, shifting. So there's a number of routes here, um, 8, 10, 14, 28, 32, 35, 39, 52, 55, 57, and a number of, uh, of other routes. So uh, again, all of these are listed at mbta.com slash service changes. And that is what I have for upcoming winter 22 bus service changes. Thank you, Melissa and Kat. Um, so we will begin the next portion of the presentation. So we're, I'm gonna go over a little bit of kind of how we will go about this. So as a reminder that these changes, again, will go into effect on December 19th. Um, and from December through February, our service planning team will be reviewing uh, new ridership, crowding patterns, public feedback and internal feedback and recommend how we will be adding back service for future um, future schedule changes. If you have any questions, they can be submitted via the chat pod. While there may be, well, while we may not get all to all questions, all comments are part of the meeting record and will be shared with our MBTA leadership. To make a comment out loud, you must virtually raise your hand. To do this on the computer, press Alt Y or click the raise hand button at the bottom center of your screen. On a mobile device, tap the raise hand button in the bottom center of your screen, and on the phone, simply dial star nine. Once you raise your hand, you will be added to a queue with others who have raised their hands. I will call on folks on a first come first serve basis. When it is your turn to speak, I will say your last name or the last four digits of your phone number and let you know that I am unmuting you. If you're on a computer or mobile device, a box will pop up at the center of your screen. You will need to confirm that you'd like to un you'd like to be unmuted before you begin speaking. If you're on the phone, an, un an automated recording will let you know that you're being unmuted. You may speak as soon as that recording finishes. Once you're unmuted, everyone in the meeting can hear you. Before making your comment, please slowly state your name and any organizational affiliation. Please remember to speak slowly as we have interpreters working with us this evening. And as soon as you're finished, you will be muted once again. We will begin the comment period with, uh, uh, now. Uh, and I would ask those that would like to say a few words to raise their hands. Bear with me one second. All right, um, I am seeing my screen now. And I am going to go to uh, Stefan uh, Wench. Stefan, I'm, I'm asking to unmute you now. Hi, how is my audio? Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Excellent. Um, I'm curious if you can talk about the, uh, the training cycle for new operators and how that relates to the planning cycle for the spring schedule. So, you know, for example, if suddenly we had a miracle in January and we had a gazillion new hires, would that allow for a, uh, a, a, a bringing back of service during the winter period? Or um, does it just make sense to wait until the spring cycle, the spring schedule starts, or is it something else entirely? Hey, Stefan, uh, I can answer that and then I'll hand over to Melissa. Always good to hear your voice. Thank you. Um, great question. Uh, so they, for general awareness, so we change our schedules four times a year um, for on bus and, and rapid transit. Um, that overall process takes about three to six months per, per change, mm -hmm. but really probably about three months for um, setting say how much service can we run so we're constantly looking and doing projections on how many operators do we have 
We work closely with our HR department. What are the training size of uh, number of applicants that you're bringing in? We can get relatively good and we do hiring on a um, every two months though we are looking to see if we can hire on an even faster cycle. Um, what that means is, so for spring, we have a pretty good sense of the projections for January, though absolutely we're still pushing it and we're hoping those numbers will increase. What this means though is for spring, we're still under consideration, we're still reviewing it, but if say 200 people show up the end of January, we will still absolutely take them, we will train them, and uh, it will almost would do the reverse, I think, of what we saw when we were reducing service the first time in the pandemic of adding service. Um, we can always have additional operators running, we call runners directeds, which means um, we would run more service, though it may not be scheduled. Uh, we would even reduce drop trips further. We would absolutely find a way to use them so the service would be improved, though it may not be fully scheduled service. I think so if we saw a real improvement, um, which we hope to see in January and February, it's more likely we would see that really take effect in the summer rating, which I believe starts either May or June. Um, but so I think the, sh the short answer is in the immediate term, if we really see an improvement, it will improve service, though we wouldn't necessarily be able to improve scheduled service until, um, until the summer rating. But that's my understanding right now, but I wanna check with Melissa too, if that, that sounds right and that's accurate based on the timelines that we're looking at discussing. That's correct. Our summer schedules start in mid-June. So uh, if we did get a large class of operators, uh, we'd be able to change the schedule for June, uh, but there would certainly be other things that we could do in an unscheduled way in the spring. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thanks for all the work you've put into this and all the work on uh, getting this presentation tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, and I'm going on the order of the way I've received these, I'm going to ask Mr. Emmanuel DeBarros, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, uh, I'm asking to unmute you now. Oh, yes, um, thank you. Uh, uh, someone say something? No, no, I'm just checking in, can, did you, can, can you hear us okay? Yeah, it's good. Um, so my name is Emmanuel. I'm from Alternative from Community Environment and also the T Riders Union. Um, I would just like to talk about um, in the specific um recruitment um stage you're in, really. Um, I noticed that um for a few stations such as Haymarket, um, Nubian slash Dudley and um Sullivan Square, these are high ridership stations, and I'm thinking that um you do think about um ridership there as you look at data, but also for recruitment. Um, for the past, I appreciate um, the recruitment online presence. There's a, a good presence there um, that you're looking for bus operators. But uh, I think something similar that you did for the Better Bus Project is being on, like, like being on the ground at stations. If that will help either having like people there or tabling, I think that will help out with recruitment but also um, actually telling people the training um, process um, to make um, position look better, but also trying to um, educate people on, on what's happening with the services, but also how this can also improve um, services if you are able to get um, more recruitment. Great. Thank you. Was there anything else there that you'd like to add? Um, that's all. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I will, uh, I'm going to hand over to Melissa in a moment from the Raj question. Um, uh, but I just want to say, at least on the, on the recruitment, thank you, Emmanuel. We'll, we'll actually, we'll take those and bring those back to our hiring team. I know we're always looking for new ideas and appreciate the advice and guidance. Mm -hmm. And I would also add, we're going to go back and forth because there's on the, from folks that have raised their hands, because there's some questions that are on the chat that I'd also like to get answered for folks as well. So, um, I think we had a few that were- Joe, Sorry, oh, one second. I'm going to, Melissa, there was actually a question though about how we accounted for ridership, I think, in uh, our changes. And I think it's, it's a real important point. Sorry, Angel. No, no, no. Okay. So um, two things, if I could, if I could jump in and say, mm -hmm. uh, those are great ideas for how to get um, exposure uh, to our recruitment efforts. But I also want, I, I was so happy that made me, that, that made me smile because I, I've spent a lot of time 
in those stations that you mentioned, uh, reaching out to people, because I think it's super important to have outreach forums like this uh, here online today, but also uh, getting out to um, talk to folks uh, where they are and uh, just uh, hearing you check the Better Bus Project and um, mention that made me extremely happy. So thank you for seeing us at those events and thank you for uh, the idea. Um, and we, we have been monitoring ridership uh, in, in many places. Like those places you reference uh, are very high ridership. We have uh, all sorts of data from uh, the buses, automated passenger counters, and also AFC from you know people who are tapping at, at fare gates and elsewhere in the system uh, that we're using to, to monitor where those high ridership locations are. So thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take uh, a couple of questions from folks that have raised their hands, and then we'll go to some that have uh, folks that have uh, asked questions on the group chat. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. John Buxton uh, to unmute. Uh, I'm asking you to unmute now. Can you hear me now? We can. Okay. Um, I am on the Fenway Civic Association board. We have been terribly impacted by the actions that MBTA took on the 55 bus. And um, now that you're looking at how you can schedule things better or change the routes, we're interested in your extending the route of the 55 bus so that you get um, more people on it if that's what you want and need. There are people that want it, uh, the 55 bus to, um, to connect with the orange and blue lines. There are people that want the 59 bus to go to the medical area. And certainly everyone wants the 55 bus to go downtown. It makes no sense to uh, have cut it short. Um, I can, that we had a meeting online last night with dozens and dozens of people supporting better service on the 55 line, including Representative Jay Livingstone. And he will no doubt be able to update you better than I could on what changes uh, we would like to have made. Uh, two quick uh, ideas as to how your driver shortage could be addressed. One is I am a retired math teacher. I volunteer to tutor Boston students via Zoom. And it is very satisfying for me and it serves a very important uh, Boston City student purpose. Have you contacted those who have retired recently and have the appropriate license to drive a bus to get more bus drivers? The second possibility is on the red line and orange line and other uh, subways of the like, you have one driver up front and several cars behind it. On the green line, you have not only a driver up front, but you have a driver in each car. I presume they're all licensed to, uh, for the bus service as well. And if you get somebody who is not licensed for driving a bus, they could be in the second car and the one who is licensed to drive a bus could be driving a bus. So I, I would like you to look into all the possibilities of getting more drivers so that we can have excellent service in Boston. Public transportation is a high, high priority. And you'll know from the election of Mayor Wu that we are very interested in doing transportation right. Thank you for your attention. And I hope that the situation can improve. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Buxton. Uh, I will note that I think we had someone from our team at that meeting last night, and I will un I will uh, very much be hearing from uh, Councillor Bach um, and others uh, from the group um, who have been in contact with me, including Senator Brownsberger and, and Representative Livingstone. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I've been in contact with them uh, over the last few days. So um, uh, we appreciate the comments and we'll certainly take that back um, uh, the comments around um, exploring retired drivers. I don't know the answer to that, but 
um, you know, it's worth worthwhile exploring. And I just wanted you to be creative and not just say, oh, we have a problem, I uh, can't do it. No, thank, thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, and one point of um, elaboration, because I think it is, and we absolutely, and I think that's what the prime point trying to say is that um, we're changing service now, but there's a lot of effort going away and trying to really look at every creative option we have. Um, and I think that's actually one that's come up that's not sure what we can do with it, but it's, it's definitely under investigation. Um, but for the, it is, I think, important to note on the motor persons, um, excuse me, the folks who drive our trains, including the Green Line, um, different classifications, different licenses. So if you drive a Green Line train or a Red Line train or a Blue Line train, you don't need a commercial driver's license versus if you're a bus operator, you do. And so our hiring challenges is, is much, um, much worse on the bus operator than on, on rail which I think one of the reasons you're seeing us not really change rail service is because it's the commercial driver's license shortage that I think is, is really impacting us. Yeah, well, I just want you to be uh, creative and maybe get a list of all the uh, uh, drivers who have bus license um, certification and contact all of them. Yep, absolutely. I think, I think we've even reached out to everyone at the RMV with the CDL, but yes. Absolutely, and we'll leave no stone unturned because we realize how important it is, as you said, to provide great, great public transportation in the region. Thank you very much. Well, thank thank you. you, John. Thank you for your comments. Next, I am going to ask um, Ms. Suzanne Backstrom to, uh, to unmute. Ms. Backstrom. All right, um, uh, trying to start the video. Uh, never mind. Um, my my comment is this. Uh, first of all, I'm Susan Backstrom, and I represent the T Riders Union and Green Roots in Chelsea. And I live in Chelsea. And so my questions uh, or comments are regarding are surrounding the the buses and the the, the service that 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 is near to us, and um, I did notice buses dropped on the 112 and the 110, and um, I was uh, I I'm, I'm glad that that is that that's going to be truth in advertising. I hope because I hope that you don't have to adjust it because those are pretty uh, consequential cross, cross, uh, crossing into different cities um, uh, lines, as well as 116 and 117. Um, I, I, you, uh, as, a, as a writer, I noticed that, that there were a lot of really crowded situations um recently and um and so I, I just hope that you're not adjusting the those services out into uh, a super crowded situation like it was pre-covid pre-covid 116 117 were at times sardine cans and the 111 is uh, often uh, a sardine can and um, that that isn't uh, that isn't something that we'd like to as a as a writer we like to uh, to experience, and um, it makes it hard to have a wheelchair or a walker or a um, or a cart, you know, for for groceries for the reason that we're on on the tee to begin with. It was to you know go get groceries or go get you know shopping done or or other other things accomplished other errands accomplished and and you know putting those on the um, putting those carts on on a super crowded bus is just it's really uh, it's really it's really challenging and it's really uh, can be really you know. Uh, not too much uh, fun. And um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was um, 
I understand that the the hiring for CDLs is is challenging. Um, perhaps mentor uh, people at um, Bunker Hill who are who are twenty one into the program or other universities in the area who are 21 and can get their CDL. Had somebody done that when I was in university, I would have been, you know, that would have been great. I would have already been set up for success in life. And that would have, that, that can be a really great uh, position for someone in a university situation. Um, anyway, uh, those are, uh, those are my ideas, and um, and my my question is, what exactly are you planning for the 116, 117, and the 110 and 112? And uh, I'd like to hear just now, and then we'll go from there. Thanks. I can jump in on that one. Uh, and Kat, fill in if there's anything I missed. I know uh, we only have some minor changes on the 116, 117, where we're taking some of those short trips that only start over, uh, at, I think it's the intersection of Broadway and Revere, that they don't go all the way out to Wonderland, but it's those short trips that provide extra trunk capacity where the two routes overlap. Sometimes those short trips aren't as well used because not as many people can ride them or they might come in right behind uh, one of the long trips coming from Wonderland. Uh, so by reinvesting those buses into the full length trips, we think we can help manage some of the um, bunching and crowding that you might see on those routes. Um, okay. So overall, the frequency should be better. And I think the 112 was on my uh, uh, presentation list uh, for kind of runtime updates of the, you know just general travel times have changed so the, the departure times might shift very slightly but overall it's generally the same but in general it should be more reliable because if you if you mentioned you experienced those days where like a trip that was supposed to come and then it didn't um the kind of the cumulative effect of all the changes that we're making should make those uh trips more reliable so you're you're saying you're saying those are going to be more truth in advertising. What about the one ten? I don't think that was on my list. I'm pulling up my. It, well, it was on your list of of small changes. So is that just runtime and and truth in uh, advertising? Yes, then? that was on the 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 minor changes. So th those would be right. things like new run times or the the trips might shift slightly. To, because of those new run times, uh, that's not as much um, the frequency changes that we've been talking about on some of the other routes. Okay, and uh, and I just like to thank Terry for be for involving herself in uh, you know the the fare system uh, adjustments as well. I really I I just like to like just a shout out to her. Thank you. That's it for for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also like to remind folks that you can also, if there are more specific or detailed questions that you, um, that you have around these service changes, that we encourage you to look on our website and also to email our engagement team uh, via our MBTA website. So uh, just as another reminder to folks. Uh, next, I'm gonna call um, uh, on, Mella, on Mella Bush Miles. And I'd also just like to acknowledge Terry and our entire team and Kat and her team who just do a fantastic job um, all around. So um, they, uh, they do a great job. Mela, I'm unmuting you now. Okay. My name is Mela Bush Miles and I am the Director of Transit Oriented Development and the, um, the T Riders Union. I direct the T-Riders Union, which is a program of ACE Alternatives for Community and Environment, which is located in the Nubian Square section of Roxbury. And we represent uh, riders and building a voice for um, transit justice, environmental justice, et cetera. So um, a, a couple of things. First of all, um, the 23 and the 29 uh, were recently um, celebrated uh, to be funded by $8 million of ARPA money from 
uh, that's coming into the city of Boston by our new mayor, Michelle Wu, as part of a two-year um, bus pilot, free bus pilot um, sponsored by the city of Boston. So they were on the list. And I know that the, the, uh, those buses have had, you know, long um, histories of when there's a demand response that the buses disappear into the abyss of like Ashmont Station or something, and then you never see them again for like an hour or something like that. So will this help if you're adjusting the schedules to um, really represent what is actually happening in real life, will this help to um, not, to, to make these, the buses show up on time and have more better on-time performance? That's my first question. Um, the second question is, um, yeah, I was concerned about the 29 bus route being cut and why, not cut, but adjusted down in, uh, at certain times of the day because a cut, you think you're cutting it out. So I don't want to say that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to um, say is about the, uh, how, how to attract uh, more rider, drivers and operators into the system. Many times at the board meetings, there were um, discussions about safety and quality of life. And we know that when bus drivers are forced to interact with um, riders around fare collection and things, uh, there's often um, negative interaction between the passenger and the operator un unfairly, but because of you know them having to say, oh, you don't have money, you can't get on the bus. What is being done to look at how to improve the quality of life such that you, it would make the MBTA more user-friendly, family-friendly, and attractive to someone who might want to, um, to get a job there. Uh, so that's, that's one of my um, questions. And also the last question is around recruitment fairs in schools and colleges, because I understand that the, the, the license, uh, licensed drivers, 18 and above can get um, commercial driver's licenses. And are you working with any other local areas to, um, like I know they have a CDL training with like New Market Square uh, because they have that food distribution area with the uh, meat packing plants and things. So maybe looking at into a, a partnering up with some other local organizations to do recruitment fairs within community as my co-director Emmanuel said to actually bring it out into stations like and going to schools and places like that and really um, first improving the internal uh, climate and environment of workers at the T as well, I mean, operators at the T as well as um, improving those things so that people would be more drawn and attracted to come and get one of these jobs. And also people who did retire I had a family member who did retire and moved south and went and drove a bus down south. So I don't see why you can't um, ask some people who really may want something to do to come out of retirement and come back for a while and uh, drive for a couple more years or something. I thank you for allowing me to speak. Thanks, Bella. Uh, I'm going to take the first question. I think Kat and I mixed her. Melissa and I will answer the other ones. Um, the first one on the city of Boston and the passage of the 8 million, I believe that recently passed the other day. So that's still under review. Um, so that's the only comment that I, that I would necessarily make on that. We're obviously still running the 28 pilot. Uh, and there's some data and analysis that in collaboration with the city we're currently going through at the moment. I think we want to wait and see what that looks like first. Um, so uh, that's uh, to answer your, your first question. And then on the specific service changes, I'll, I'm going to turn it over to, to Kat and, and Melissa on, uh, on some of the, the nips and tucks around the uh, uh, 29 and 23. We'll try to do our best job to tag team this. And Mel, also always good to hear your voice. Um, the, so I'll try to go through um, my best. So first on the on-time performance, 
Great question. And I think the answer is a little bit of yes and a little bit of no. And Melissa will keep me honest here too. So for everyone, on-time performance is essentially saying, so we present to the public a schedule, the bus is supposed to run every 10 minutes or on the half hour. How close to that schedule did it run? Um, so uh, doing more truth in advertising should partially help on-time performance. And that's if the on-time performance has been impacted on the fact of the example I gave of if we're dropping trips and there are more people waiting at a bus stop, you, exactly as you well know, and many of us know, is like it takes that more time than for everyone to board, pay their fares, get on the bus. And if you've dropped several trips in a row, the dwell times of that bus get longer and longer. So the amount of time is the bus stop so that it's be falling more and more behind its schedule. So doing truth in advertising and getting closer to the service that we can deliver, that should help that portion of OTP. That being said, um, and I think we try to say this in our board meetings too, um, traffic is, our buses now go 20% slower than they did 10 years ago. Um, and so the traffic and the variability of traffic is also a key impact on our on-time performance, which is why the T and the city of Boston are working so hard and, and other cities in the region to invest in more transit priority because that helps the reliability of buses. Um, and on, I'll speak briefly also to the recruiting, absolutely, without getting into all the detail, Mella, but I absolutely agree. It, it's really important that also when we bring in operators, we try to make the job as appealing as possible. Um, and I, I can't speak to all the fair transformation, but there are other things we're trying to do, such as, like we said, promoting more part-timers to full-timers so that um, you come in as a part-timer and then you sort of move up to a full-timer. We're trying to make that as quick as possible so that more people can get to a 40 hour work week as fast as possible, if, if that's what they want. Um, which we think is one thing will make the job more attractive as well. But I'm gonna hand over to Melissa now. I hope that was helpful. Also, uh, good to hear your voice again, Mela. Uh, the, the one change that I put on my uh, response to touch on was the, the 29 schedule. Um, so we're not talking about like eliminating the 29, these are just, as, as Angel's been calling them, nips and tucks. Um, so it's more of a matter of, you know, taking, say, the peak schedule and maybe starting the off-peak, I think it's about an hour or an hour and a half earlier in, in, um, in uh, one of the, the peaks. I was trying to find my uh, notes. So uh, it's that's the general gist of the, the type of change that you would be seeing. But much of the day, it would be largely the same schedule that you see today. It's just a few of these uh, narrow bands where there would be those changes. That answer, uh, thank you for that, Melissa, much appreciated. Next, um, I am going to ask um, Craig, Greg Zelt, I'm gonna ask to unmute you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you for hosting this meeting. I always appreciate when the public is given the chance to provide comments, questions, and feedback. Um, and I think this question is more of a mix of feedback and a question. Um, so I guess my main question would be, would you consider having the affected bus routes, namely the ones with decreased service, would you consider having uh, the MBTA designated parking lots that they're affected by have maybe a reduced price? Um, the example I think of is I see that 106 and 108 are having decreased route usage, which is the bus route I would take to get to specifically the Malden Center rail stop. And I know that's what many of the other Malden residents do as well. Um, like I think some people, myself included, will be willing to just drive to the T-stop instead. Um, however, the price for me at least is kind of prohibitive for parking in that lot all day. So I'm wondering if it'd be possible to have those MBTA parking lots reduced in price if the bus routes are being decreased in response to the admittedly lower rider or not rider driver engagement at this moment if i could jump in though i just wanted to make one thing clear we don't need you to drive to the station because we ran the numbers and we think there's capacity 
uh, on the buses. Uh, we've looked at the existing ridership and making sure that we have a cushion to accommodate future growth. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of say, don't feel the need to change your mode because we want you to continue to ride the bus, please. <laughs> Kat, I don't know if you had something else you were gonna say though. Uh, no, I, I think the only thing I was going to just to separate is uh, exactly what Melissa said, and I would separate um, us changing what scheduled services and trying to increase ridership is obviously related, but two different efforts. Um, but the question, and I know this has come up as well in previous months on particular commuter rail is a way to help restore commuter rail uh, ridership. Um, so happy to take this back to the commercial strategies team. I'm sure it's something they're looking at, uh, but unfortunately I can't speak to it. But I think Melissa's point is fair. It's we should have enough space for people to take the buses. If you're taking the bus, please continue to take the bus. And then um, the, the, the lower ridership is not the reason that we're changing our service schedules this winter. Um, but we'll pass it along. So thank you for the, for the comment and question. And no problem. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak. Thank you. Uh, next, um, I'm going to ask uh, Thea Stovell. Thea, I'm gonna ask to unmute you. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, Tia Stovell, I'm the superintendent of Randolph Public Schools. And I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, I found out about the change to the 240 this evening. I'm curious how the process goes, like how would you know if someone hadn't told you, am I supposed to check your website or do you send information out? And then I'm also trying to figure out how are you, when are you going to make decisions about reinstating um, dis services that's been disrupted. Uh, I think about the 240 in terms of, it's a, it's a bus stop where many of our high school students, when they get out of school, go to the bus. And who do I talk to about uh, possible uh, time changes if you were to reinstate that bus as we're looking to change our um, start and end times for high school? So I'm, I'm just curious, is this something that you would normally do through the town? Is it an expectation that I should be reaching out? Um, to the T uh, for future um, possibility of extended service or or other disrupted service. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Superintendent. On the reaching out piece, my suggestion uh, on that would be to have uh, folks over at City Hall reach out to the T. They can reach out to me directly. Um, I handle those uh, intergovernmental affairs for the MBTA. Um, and uh, I'm happy to provide you, if you shoot me a, a direct message, I'm happy to provide you with my contact information. Thank you. And uh, Melissa or, or Kat, I don't know if you wanna handle the, the piece on um, uh, on where, where we go on that. Yeah, um, our office is often uh, coordinating with the superintendents or uh, depending uh, on the different structure, uh, with the districts directly. Uh, we're often sending out uh, kind of reminders, usually in the spring, I want to say around uh, March or April, to say, you know, hey, are there any schedule changes planned for next fall? Uh, because these changes typically happen in the fall, though we did have a few uh, surprise changes during COVID when uh, some folks switched to hybrid schedules. But we're the ones who are looking at uh, the existing schedules and the capacity of existing routes to meet the demand. And if the existing routes have sufficient capacity, uh, then uh, it's, it's our ideal to have as many uh, students riding kind of the regular services. But there are some places where uh, there's not enough capacity on the, the regular services. So we do sometimes have what we call trippers that are operating uh, that um, provide extra capacity uh, to certain schools when needed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I am going to uh, ask uh, uh, Yang Zi Feng, and I'm going to ask to unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Yang Zi Feng, and I'm. Uh, I have two uh, specific comments uh, slash questions about the Route 52 changes. Um, so the first comment uh, is, uh, pertains to the span of service, um, specifically pre-COVID and at various points during COVID. Uh, the first trip of the day on the 52 was scheduled uh, between 6.06 a.m. and 6.15 a.m. And uh, for the current schedule, for the fall 2021 schedule, 
the first trip of the day is at, at 6.25 a.m. However, with the winter schedule, um, the first trip becomes 6.45 a.m., which is uh, a full half hour reduction in the span of service. So um, obviously that is a negative change in terms of you know, riders who need to use the bus um, early in the morning to get to work um, outside of the usual nine to five. Um, and so that's something I wanted to ask about is what the rationale was behind that change if, if, um, if the team on this call uh, knows. Um, and then the second comment um, is regarding the 52's uh, changes throughout the entire afternoon. So from one o'clock onward until the end of service. Um, specifically, uh, you know, it, for the fall schedule, um, service is scheduled uh, at roughly consistent 40 to 45 minute headways, uh, starting from around 1.05 p.m. until 6.45 p.m. Um, so, th so this would mean uh, two buses every 85 minutes during the, uh, for the fall schedule. And for the winter schedule, the same level, overall level of service is being maintained. Um, at uh, 80, every uh, two buses every 85 minutes. However, the scheduling is very problematic because instead of having a bus every 40 to 45 minutes, there is a bus, um, it, you know, there is a one hour headway followed by a 20 minute headway, uh, meaning that uh, for a rider, there would be a significant in increase in uh, wait time. So to give you some context, um, you know, previously the schedules looked like 105 departure, 145, 225, et cetera. Now it's 101, 123, and then there's an hour gap um, until 225, uh, between 123 and 225. And so that looks like, you know, the very definition of deliberate bus bunching. There will be very few riders um, on the second bus that follows the first bus um, based on the way the schedule is set up. And it seems like some type of deliberate sabotage, even if, if I may, um, of the ridership on the 52 um, with the schedule that's seemingly, that's essentially unusable, um, dropping from 40 minute headways to one hour headways. Um, and so, and this also seems, you know, really wasteful and unnecessary if the MBTA is run, looking to run hourly headways on the 52 to run that second bus uh, following 20 minutes. Behind. So I just wanted to ask what the rationale was behind that second change. Um, in terms of switching from consistent 40 to 45 minute headways throughout the afternoon and evening to inconsistent headways of 60 minutes followed by 20, 20 minute headways. I mean, in fact, sometimes it's a you know, 65 minute headway followed by an 18 minute headway. Um, and it's really confusing why this change is being made, especially because you know, all uh, based on everything the MBTA's uh, Better Bus Project has mentioned, um, this, the the uh, ideal bus service would look like consistent headways throughout the day. This is the, doing the exact opposite. We have consistent headways as it is, and now we're moving to very, very inconsistent headways and very unpredictable service uh, for riders. So I just wanted to um, see if there are any answers to those that the team on here can provide. I can provide some commentary. This is Melissa. Um, thanks for flagging that. I haven't looked at that particular schedule. Uh, the intention was not to intentionally sabotage the route or anything. What we had been doing was responding to a number of complaints we'd gotten from, I think it might have been the same meeting about three months ago, uh, when we were hearing from school administrators at Oak Hill Middle School and the Brown Middle School. Uh, and also, uh, there are also a number of the 52 riders from Mount Alvernia. Uh, and those, those schools make up a substantial portion of the Route 52's ridership. Uh, so, so normally, uh, we try to make services as even as possible, uh, but sometimes we do try to shift them when there are like large populations of people making similar trips. So when you have either some school travel or sometimes we have factory shift workers or nurses or some other folks who are making kind of concentrated trips at certain times where we'll customize things. So um, let, let me take this comment back to the team and see if there's a better middle ground where we can, uh, you know, try to maximize the benefit to everyone without leaving such uh, irregular gaps in service because um, that sounds pretty extreme to me. So uh, we'll, we'll take a look, but thank you for flagging that. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to just uh, very quickly, uh, there were some questions that were in the chat and I mentioned earlier that we like to kind of go over uh, and I'm going to pull those up now uh, from our team. Uh, and the first question is, 
Um, it, the question is, you stated example change schedule from every 10 minutes to every 12 minutes. But what about express buses to Boston? Um, were Melissa or Kat, I, I didn't know if you had a particular answer on that. I haven't hit it, Melissa. I think the, the specific question, it probably varies by express bus. So think about the 500 series. Mm -hmm. uh, I would strongly encourage with the schedules online, folks to take a specific look at that to get the, mm -hmm. uh, the exact details of, of how much they're changing. Obviously the buses that are running uh, less frequently than every 10 minutes, there, there may be a, a larger change, but all the schedules should now be online. So you can see exactly, yeah. depending on when you're traveling and where you are traveling, what that frequency now is. Mm -hmm. And we encourage folks to take a look at our trip finder that provides that information specifically there as well. So um, I could also add, um, so we have frequency changes for certain express routes like the 501 and the 504. Uh, and, and also just to flag, um, in many cases, those routes are doing double duty because as many folks know, we haven't restored the 502s or the um, 503s. So but we, we wanted to make sure that there are still options available. So former 502 and 503 riders are still able to use the 501 and 504 because those have been modified to serve Copley. So we've tried to be thoughtful about um, the services that we provide and continuing to provide mobility. It might not be the exact same route that people took pre-COVID, uh, but that there are still in many cases options available to folks. So uh, where we've Restored services, those are uh, in places where there were the fewest options. There are some places where we haven't yet restored service. I know there were other um, comments earlier on uh, some different routes or like the 55. And in some of those cases, we have uh, alternate services that are within a quarter mile. So we've really been focusing on restorations where the available alternatives uh, are farther away. Uh, and th there, there might still be some places where we haven't quite uh, gotten uh, everyone whose service is over a third of a mile away, but we've, we've gotten very many of those, uh, but we recognize we're not at our pre-COVID service levels, so we're not able to um, uh, provide exactly the service levels that we had pre-COVID. Thank you, Melissa. The next question I have here from the chat is, why are the 1938 SL1 chosen for increased service and other routes not? I can handle that. So um, we're, we're trying to balance a number of different things uh, in the places where we added them, like that example of the 38 trip, it literally had 70 people on one specific trip uh, and, and we needed to not provide those sardine-like conditions. But our projections are that while those other places where we're reducing service might have crowding, it's not it's not systematic crowding across every trip. There's generally capacity there might be some crowding where like if there's a trip missed, then the next trip will have a lot of people on it. But then on, on average, we expect that crowding should remain within acceptable levels, even with the frequency changes that we're talking about. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next, I'm going to call on uh, Mr. Brian Howard. I'm gonna ask to unmute you. Uh, my name is Brian Howard. I'm the uh, town manager in the town of Randolph. Um, I'm following up on the superintendent's question. I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to get a sense of uh, the change on the bus at Randolph High School. Um, so if I look at the the, uh, it looks like um, there was a 2:30 and a 2:33 on the uh, time on the 2:40, um, and now when I look at uh, the new one. Uh, it just says 233. So is, is that the elimination of the bus uh, that uh, at, at, in front of Randolph High School? That's correct. That was the trip from uh, in front of Randolph High School. Um, we, we, as I mentioned in the earlier comment uh, from the superintendent, we do sometimes have extra service that we provide when there is uh, not sufficient capacity. One of the things that happened with, I don't know if the bell time changed after our hours, um, no, uh, correspondence had gone out, um, but the, the students had generally been arriving after our bus had left, uh, and we found that the regular service was able to accommodate the passengers within our crowding standards, and it seemed to be working. So that is why, uh, you know, if 
if we if we don't need to have a, a dedicated school bus uh, because we're not we're not a school bus operator uh, we're actually prohibited from providing school bus trips uh, we have to certify this to the FTA in our triennial review every three years which actually is starting next month um, so we we're very attuned to when we're adding trips for convenience and when we're adding them for capacity needs because we're allowed to add them for capacity needs but not for convenience all right um all right so i i, I mean I'll, I'll follow up a little bit more out uh, you know by email on this uh i mean i i get a sense that uh you're correct that there was a schedule change and that that that's why the uh the 230 uh or the 233 um doesn't have the numbers that it, you know that it used to have um the when i when i look at um i was trying to figure out exactly what the changes are on the 240 and, and on the 238. Um, when I call up the maps or the, the, the schedules, um, because the fonts are different and, and et cetera, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I got to admit, uh, um, it kind of all blends into one uh, to me. So I, I don't know, you don't have to provide it right now, but I, I didn't know if somebody afterwards could email me specifically what the changes are on the on the 240 and the 238. I will say, and I don't know if this is a typo, but on the new map, uh, the, the the one that takes over, uh, on the outbound side, it looks like you flip-flopped the Holbrook Randolph station on the outbound with the Avon Square. Um, and, and I don't know if that's intentional, meaning that you're shifting the times that used to go to Avon Square with, with the Holbrook Randolph um, uh, commuter rail station uh, drop off, um, but it just seemed un unique to me that the times literally uh, just flip flopped. So I don't know if that's a uh, if that was intentional uh, or a uh, or or a uh, a misprint on the schedule. Thanks for flagging that, and uh, yeah, we can continue this uh, offline. In that particular case, I know that we uh, have had some kind of typesetting changes to try to make the schedule cards easier to read. I don't know if something got uh, lost in translation there. So I'm writing this down and I'm gonna flag that for our public schedules coordinator to uh, dig into. So thanks for uh, flagging that. And if we get your contact information, Angel, is there a way that we can have a follow-up mm -hmm. afterwards? Okay, yeah, if you send your contact information to Angel uh, and uh, then we can, uh, continue the discussion on what changed on, uh, on those routes. Yep. Yeah, that'd be great. And then uh, just a quick follow-up. And again, this can be by the email afterwards. Um, I, I The bus ridership, um, the 240 and the 238 weren't shown on it because they must not be on that. When, when, when you went over and did the original presentation. Um, but I would be curious if I could get those numbers after the fact, uh, just to see what it looked like before the pandemic and after the pandemic. Um, just to kind of get some, uh, you know, some numbers uh, on that. So, um, thank you. Um, I will, um, you know, e uh, I can chat my email address to uh, Angel. I think. All right, yeah, excellent. Work. Uh, thank you. Uh, I I, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next, I am going to go to John Pelletier, and I'm going to ask to unmute you right now. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much. I'll try to be somewhat brief, uh, John Pelletier. Um, on a slightly a side note, I work for Harvard Transit, and uh, we are also having some issues with the bus driver hiring. So it is definitely system wide. Um, but I know you guys are definitely working hard. Um, so definitely appreciate that. Uh, one uh, first comment um, around the 504. Uh, and it's mainly a missed opportunity, I'd say. Um, the weekday service, you know, slight change there seems, you know, probably okay based on current demand levels and my experience with it. Um, I'm a Newton resident. Uh, and, uh, but the weekend is one where I would have hoped I would have seen some, some changes simply because the current route doesn't match at all with the 553 running local service. So if you're, if you're looking for somebody to use the 553 running inbound, obviously from the normal circumstances that runs uh, in or did run inbound on weekdays, never ran in the 
the weekends. But if somebody wanted to get downtown, they're going to take the 553 and they're going to connect to the 504. But your average wait time right now for that connection is 38 minutes. Uh, if you were to take the 553 to Newton Corner and hang out for the 504, um, there's only one time during the day where your wait time is about 10 minutes, which based on bus schedules, stuff like that, um, it's kind of, I think, what you want to have. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at the weekend schedule for the 504. I did some back of the envelope calculations. I got the average wait time to be down about 16 minutes, maintaining the, the same uh, time headway between trips. So I think there's some, some room for optimization there to make sure folks that are looking to go inbound are able to make a connection um, with, the, with the buses um, there. Uh, the second point is more broadly, um, in areas where you've seen uh, bus congestion, I know there's certainly a lot of movement toward uh, bus lanes and you mentioned briefly about uh, priority signalization. Are you reaching out to those communities or those identified areas to push them or ask them about you know, implementing a bus priority signal here or a bus lane here to kind of help increase the amount of buses that can get through an area, decrease the overall trip time, thereby at least maintaining or perhaps increasing service. Uh, and so just kind of thinking what that looks like uh, at a higher level. Uh, and thank you very much. Those are great, those are great questions. Uh, Melissa, Kat, did you wanna take a stab at answering some of those? Certainly our office can take a look at the coordination question. There's always a trade-off between coordination, just like we were having the, the conversation uh, in the context of the 52 about trying to shift trips to meet certain populations uh, when it might change the span uh, for other populations. But um, we can see if there are any uh, solutions that improve uh, opportunities for everyone without creating uh, any of those awkward gaps. Um, there's also, I know, um, this might not be the fastest option, depending on where you're trying to go, but the transfer opportunities to the 57 offer, uh, offer a much greater headway so that there would be not those 38 minute gaps, but something more like the five to 10 ish uh, minute gaps that would make for a far better transfer. Uh, so we do have some other options. Um, There's one more point that I was gonna make, but it's escaped me, so Kat. I can jump in and get some cover while you think of it, Melissa. Um, I'll speak to the transit priority and transit signal prioritization. Uh, for those who don't know, transit priority is the general term for anything that helps buses move faster and more reliably, as well as things like the Green Line, where we share um, the roadway with cars. Um, that can take the place of a bus lane, what we call a queue jump, so a bus can get up ahead to get through an intersection faster, or transit signal priority, which um, if it sees a public transit vehicle coming, it gives a longer green to the vehicle so it can get through traffic faster. Um, so it's more dynamic timing for your signals. Um, we, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, we actively work with a large number of municipalities and towns on increasing bus priority um, throughout uh, and take it through a number of vehicles. Um, so constantly reaching out about where we see the most congestion our transportation department, our planning department, and various transportation departments work very closely together. Um, and I think um, there's probably been a lot of news people saw about our first ever regional center bus lanes that just opened up in Columbus Avenue uh, in Boston, which is fantastic and really exciting. But at the same time, over the past two, three years, I think we've built 12, 14, maybe even 16 miles, please don't quote me, on um, side running bus lanes which are incredibly effective as well and tend to be very very quick builds even just in the last few weeks i think over mass ave and cambridge they've put down paints up towards alewife um uh, i believe out in lynn um and i believe out in revere so there's constantly projects going uh though as it gets colder we're going to be on hold with the rest of the construction cycle until the spring um and those are uh, constantly looking at actually one of the best things you can do if you think there should be a bus lane is, is reaching out to your own city and town and attending public meetings is speaking out in support of them. Um, and then on transit signal priority, which is a very sort of, it's not as public, but it's, it has a huge impact. This is one thing that we're really excited about. Um, I think the, we are working very hard to be, I would say, nation leading in transit signal priority uh, and are currently working on uh, working with um, TSP providers to develop a new next-gen uh, specification 
that allows us to be a lot more advanced and a lot more thoughtful about uh, RTSB. So I say stay tuned on that over the next year. We're really excited for what's coming. Um, and then a bus priority, it's, it's, it's really important. Um, but at the end of the day, as folks know, we don't own the streets, we own the buses. And so it requires a lot of really hard, thoughtful collaboration between the communities, between the, the local municipalities and obviously the T to figure out the best use is of, of the space that is available, thinking between pedestrians, single occupancy vehicles, buses, bicycles, and trying to be very thoughtful and collaborative. But it's, it's definitely something that uh, we have a whole team dedicated to it, uh, and it's really important to them, ETA. Thank you, and we'll set cat. Uh, just a quick question we got here from the group, from the chat. Uh, is the new crowding standards from COVID still being reflected in the service changes? So my understanding is we, um, sorry, can you repeat that question once more, Angel? Yeah, is the new crowding standard from COVID still being reflected in the service changes? No, so my understanding is we have reverted back to our historical levers, um, levels of defining what is crowded um, to pre-COVID. That being said, we're still running in many cases more service on some routes than we had um, pre-COVID. So we're still trying to, I think, try to keep that in mind where we can. But whenever you're riding and you see, if you're looking at an app or real-time sign, um, the real-time crowding information, all that is assuming uh, pre-COVID standards, which is defined in our service delivery policy about what those are. And that is for both um, bus and rapid transit. Just to add, I think we went back to using the pre-COVID standard in approximately May of mm -hmm. uh, this year, if I remember. Yep. That sounds right. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Mr. John Pelletier. I'm going to ask to unmute you. Mr. Pelletier, you've been asked to unmute. All right, I apologize. It seems that we might be having some technical difficulties on that. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to call and ask to unmute Mr. Bob Fisherman. Mr. Fisherman, you've been asked to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, I live in uh, Boston and I, uh, usually, pre-COVID, uh, commuted to uh, Northwest. Hello, uh, did we lose you? Hello? And now I feel with the shortened route, it really doesn't benefit anything uh it's a 20 to 25 minute frequency uh but the connection to the 350 it always is late and it just turns an hour and a half commute into a two and a half hour commute and it really doesn't make sense anymore uh so i was hoping uh to know the reasoning behind the shortened route and potentially uh, soon, if you could get it back to its full form. Thanks for that comment. I'll, I'll jump in. I couldn't quite hear everything you said, but I think you're talking about the Route 351, which in um, not this current schedule, but in past schedule changes had been uh, turned into a local bus instead of being an express bus as a, as a sort of pilot. Um, we're reviewing the, the ridership uh, changes, so uh, these are things that we can change moving forward uh, with, um, depending on, on the ridership response. I haven't looked at the, the numbers, the, the sort of philosophy was, you know, if we made it a local bus for a local fare and had it uh, more often with time transfers to and from the 350, if we could make something that was more appealing than the old 351s express structure. So that was the theory, um, trying to make it more like a, a normal uh, uh, route. 
Um, but that's a uh, useful feedback and we can take it back and look as we're considering what to do um, in future schedule changes. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, there was a question on the chat. What is being done to control crowding on the 32 bus during a school arrival in dismissal times? The bus hasn't been running consistently enough to handle the volume. I'll jump in. And I think there are certain routes when we were talking about the impacts to the schedule of uh, the drop trips right now. Uh, you know, we're, we're dropping about 5% of service, but that experience isn't felt uniformly across the system. There's certain routes um, because they're the only high frequency routes in their garages, certain routes like the 32 and the 111 and the 77 are probably feeling uh, maybe closer to like 10% or even more uh, service loss uh, because of uh, just kind of how the the, the the drop trips and which runs are vacant and some other things. So those areas we're having more crowding uh, today. It's we're we're very much hoping that uh, if we can reduce the amount of trips that are being dropped, those will be felt most dramatically on those places that are bearing the brunt of things now, the 32 and the 77 and the 111. So um, all these um, changes, we can make lots of small changes uh, across the system. We think that the biggest beneficiaries of those are gonna be on um, some of the routes that you're describing. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, the other question we had um, uh, is, uh, I take the 65 and the 57 to work and back. They have 10 to 50 minute frequencies, but often see the buses in a row and wait for 20 minutes for a bus. What is happening and how can this be addressed so there's better consistency? Is this being addressed in the new schedules? Could you repeat that? Sorry, I just wasn't clicking. Yeah. yeah. I take the 65 and the 57 bus to and from work. They have 10 to 15 minute frequencies, but I often see them, uh, I often see the buses in a row and waiting for 20 minutes for a bus. What is happening and how can this be addressed so that there's better consistency? Is this being addressed in the new schedules? So essentially bunching of, around the buses. Um, so that, that seems to be the question. Yeah, some of those bunching issues can be caused uh, when are exacerbated when we have a disconnect between the travel time. So um, I know uh, our team is often looking at the travel times and I think we did rebuild the 57 schedule recently. Uh, I'll have to double check my notes on this one uh, to try to do again, some of these truth in advertising changes to reflect uh, the changes in travel time. So um, I, can, I can flag those as if we if we haven't addressed those recently to kind of put them on the, the review list uh, for an upcoming schedule change. I would just add again, just bunching, I think we've covered it's caused by a lot of things, right? So if we're dropping trips, crowding, the crowding increases the time of buses at each bus stop. So the buses get closer and closer together. Um, as Melissa said, if we haven't built the schedules to take into account how much traffic there is or how long it takes a bus to get from point A to point B, that can also cause bunching. And then also I keep talking about traffic because I just we're not buses aren't the only things on the street. Um, it increases the variation uh, of how long something might take to get from point A to point B. Uh, and for anyone who who works in operations, understands that variation is 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 the worst thing because it just makes it so difficult to plan and predict. Um, so those are a number of factors that cause bus bunching. So some some we can immediately control, and, and some that take longer term planning, and, and then also working with municipality control. Um, but it's, it's definitely something we'll take a look at, particularly those routes. Thank you. Uh, another, I'm going to go to one more question on the chat, and then I'm going to go to uh, some folks that have raised their hands. Uh, I saw that the seven bus, is, seven bus is having trips cut from its schedule. The bus route is frequently crowded with lines uh, at stops in, in the AM and PM commutes. Uh, with buses too full to support the pickups, with more housing being added in South Boston, what is the logic behind this? Yeah, so this is in line with many of the other uh, small frequency adjustments we've been proposing. 
uh, we've only been proposing frequency changes during those times of day where our ridership numbers suggest that there's uh, sufficient capacity to meet those demands. So uh, if there were periods of long lines, uh, ideally those would not be the periods where we're cutting. I'm not sure um, mm -hmm. if your data is different what uh, ours is yeah. looking at. And uh, in general, the seven has, it's one of those routes that uh, in general has, I would say a higher proportion of like the nine to five workers who are uh, doing uh, some either hybrid work or remote work because we have seen uh, ridership drop off a little bit more than in some other uh, communities just in general, um, which is why I think there's a, a little bit of room to, to look at frequency. And I would also add that the, the ridership of compared to pre-pandemic levels on the seven uh, is about 35 and a half percent of its pre-COVID ridership. So um, uh, th those numbers are obviously, they're not where they were before, but that their ridership is not bounced back compared to some of those other uh, routes as well. So just for context for folks to have. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to call on Kunul Butla. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. I'm asking you to unmute now. Hi, I'm Kunal. Um, I live in Lexington. I go to school in Cambridge. So I take the bus and the red line to reach there. Uh, until now, I've been taking the 6276 to Alewife and then connecting from there. And so far, what I've seen is like a 20 to like 60 minute wait time, depending on the time of day uh, for a bus. But with these changes, uh, with the route splitting during rush hour times, it looks like it's going to take twice as long to make that to get see a bus because there's more like 40 minute wait times between buses, even going up to like 120 minutes at points. Um, and so with these changes, it doesn't seem to actually reduce the travel time from like along the route. So I'm wondering kind of what the rationale is and where the um, kind of what the reasoning is, because there hasn't been too much like overcrowding or um, like seeming um, like capacity issues on the routes itself. Yeah, so the main issue, uh, we've been running, as you mentioned, the combined 62 slash 76 uh, pretty much since COVID began. Uh, that serves some people well, but other people not so well. Uh, we've been hearing from some folks who are stranded uh, from, you know, Bedford Street in North Lexington or other stretches of Pleasant and I think it's Watertown Street uh, that uh, were not served by the combined route. So there are some people uh, who actually were well served by the combined 6276, but then there are other folks who are taken on a much longer trip. You know, if they were coming to or from Bedford and taking the kind of scenic tour of uh, Hanscom uh, on the way to LA, that can add significant travel time. So uh, it was trying to balance the the, the needs of those who were stranded by the combined schedule uh, and those who were um, taken on very long detours by the combined schedule with the desire to have some direct services during certain times of day. Thank you. Uh, I do not um, see any additional questions on the chat. And I do not see any additional raised hands. I would make one more request for folks if they would like to raise their hands. Uh, there are 10, uh, 10 minutes. If you are going, if you are, if you like to speak, I would ask that you raise your hand um, using the raise your hand feature um, before uh, the meeting time so we can acknowledge you. So if you are going to, if you'd like to speak, again, please raise your hand. And if you're on the phone, uh, you can do so by dialing star nine. Uh, Tracy Hunt, I'm going to ask to unmute you. Oh, you stepped right out. Um, I think someone's, hold on. Mella Bush Miles, you, uh, you just raise your hand. I'm going to unmute you now. So a quick question. <clears throat> this actually relates to something you said, Melissa, about the um, fair transformation Charlie Card vending machine rollout. Um, am I to understand that the Charlie Card that, that will be distributed through that machine, I believe we had conversations in the past during trans fair transformation 
um, meetings. Um, will that be a card that people have to uh, pay for? I know this is not related to service cuts, but I wanted some clarification since there's a number of riders and residents in the room here. And how, what is the price of that? If you're putting those vending machines, uh, starting to put them out there, do people have to pay? Because there was a tweet that went out about a lot of people's Charlie cards expiring and people were confused about that. I saw that yesterday or today. Mela, those are great questions. Um, unless Angel, I definitely don't have the correct answers and I don't I want don't. to go astray. So I might ask, we can have the fair transformation team follow up with you directly yep. with that information. Mela, well, could you, could you um, uh, send me a direct message with your contact info and I'll, I'll make sure that we can track that. Okay. Please, thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to ask to unmute Donna D. I'm asking you to unmute you now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I um, asked the question in the chat about the 32 bus and the overcrowding during school arrival and dismissal times, but I didn't, I don't understand how it's going to improve. I didn't really understand the answer. Sure. Melissa, do you want to take a stab or do you want me to take a stab? Maybe you give it a try and I'll follow up. Sure. So, um, so there's a couple of issues going on in the 32. And again, um, some of them yeah, is I think a, a number of bell times, bell times being when schools start or end, uh, have shifted. So I think this year they're much more compressed than they've been in the past. I think there also might be some new schools that's also exasperating it exacerbating um, and then particularly on how the changes be so in general the MBTA's policy for how we manage when we don't have enough operators to run service is we drop trips or we'll try to remove trips from the routes that have the least amount of impact on a, a passenger and what we mean by that is um, in general we, if we have to drop one trip we'll pull it from a high frequency route first before we pull yeah. the frequency I've, I've noticed that. I understand the problem, but how are we going to make it better? Right. I, I take so, this bus um, every morning around 6.30 and it's just, it's ridiculous. And then in the afternoon around 3.45 going back to Forest Hills, it's ridiculous. We need to have more. I mean, if it ran on schedule, that'd be great if it came every six minutes like it's supposed to. But how is the new schedule going to improve on that? So well, if what, I could also add... I didn't Please. mention this in my earlier response, but one of the things is I know that the 32 is one of those routes that had we had taken a lot of time out of the schedule during COVID because uh, travel times were great. And actually we were having such short travel times that buses were stacking up at um, Wolcott Square. Uh, so, um, but now uh, with existing congestion, that means that the buses are often running late. So even though they're supposed to be every six minutes, they right. weren't coming every six. And then are. on top of that, they were getting some drop trips. So it's been right. um, just not a good experience for passengers on the 32. It so has not been a good run experience. Times, it has yes. not. All school year, it's been awful. So um, with the new winter schedules that start, uh, we've taken a fresh look at the runtime. So hopefully that will eliminate the component of the problem caused by not enough time in the schedule. So that'll make it a little easier for the trips to maintain the headway that they're supposed to, the frequency that they're supposed to be on. And then on top of that, by having, um, hopefully that's the plan, less likelihood of dropped trips that will also help to try to keep to the regular schedule. So, you know, if everything ran to schedule, there's scheduled capacity, but the issue is that we haven't been running to schedule recently, but that should improve right. in December. Why is it going to improve? I don't understand why. Because we're giving more time. So, you know, if we said to a bus driver that, okay, you have 40 minutes to get from one end of the line to the other line, but if it was actually taking 50 minutes, they're going to be not able to run their next trip on time. And if you do that uh, for uh, many trips in a row, by the you know third or fourth trip on that driver's run, they're going to not be anywhere close to schedule. So if we give them the time that we're seeing that it takes to get from point A to point B, then they'll be able to run their trips on time. So they will be running every six minutes. Well, that or is whatever the, the new schedule. Try. I don't know what, what, the schedule, yeah. whatever's whatever on the it schedule. is in the new schedule. 
Great. Uh, I'll hold you to that. Thank you. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, Next, I'm going to ask Tracy Hunt. I'm going to ask to unmute you. Good evening, everybody. I know we're almost there. (laughs) Um, So I don't know, you might have already touched on this before. Um, Why can't the 55 bus go to Park Street? And the reason why is because I think we had this discussion before. Um, You know, seniors are not able to go to Kenmore or to Mass Ave. um, And they would like to go downtown. And since we already have a bus driver, because I know you were mentioning about the shortage, um, but why can't they go to Park Street? Great question. So we recognize that there are parts of our network that aren't um, what they ran pre-COVID. We've been focusing on places where uh, we've been stranding folks with some of our forging ahead changes, places where we had uh, cut some services that were the only service in their area. In this case, There are other options. It's within a quarter mile between the Route 55 stops and many other bus stops uh, on Brookline Ave that will connect to the Green Line and take people to downtown. The 55 is also running parallel to the Green Line. So um, it's uh, based on the amount of resources that it was taking to provide a sort of duplicative service. That's why it um, sort of bubbled uh, to the top of the list of which things are still not operating. But there, there still are several other routes uh, that are, are, are not yet looking, operating, we recognize. Yeah, are you guys looking to reimagine it in, in some other like different routes or something? Because we are looking at a possibility of the star market moving to 401 Park Drive, which is gonna be really, really hard for a lot of um, seniors and uh, folks with mobility issues. Um, is there any kind of like looking in the future of maybe kind of rerouting it somewhere? Um, to add more people to the bus, because I know it, it is a, right now a little ridership, um, but that's also because, um, you know, and I'm not going to go there, but I know there was like, when it first came back, there wasn't really a whole lot of um, marketing that went out to the neighborhood to let people know that it was back, and now it's only partial service, um, and but now, you know, there's a lot of development going on in the Fenway, and those folks are, you know, are going to need to use the bus. And, you know, we definitely don't want a whole lot of more cars in the Fenway because it's crazy over here. If you've been over here, um, there's always somebody, you know, unfortunately getting hit over there by Bolson Street. It's insane. So we definitely want to really, you know, make sure we have this bus. It's, it's really important for us to have this. Um, so it, it'd be great to, you know, if you guys can have that conversation to, um, you know, to keep it and also kind of restore it and then also kind of re- reroute it maybe, you know, so that it can be more utilized. Absolutely. We have a process called the bus network redesign, uh, separate from uh, what meeting. we're looking at. Sorry. Yeah. And, and we've been thinking of, you know, how can we reimagine something uh, that can serve the neighborhood better than what the 55 was doing. Right. Um, say, like, what would it take to have something that, say, connected folks to the Longwood Medical Area and also the Green Line and the Red Line? Or, you know, we've been looking at some other concepts of how we can kind of structure the network uh, in a different way. So um, we, we uh, plan to kind of increase our outreach, outreach on the bus network redesign and start showing draft maps, which I think are going to be super exciting, and then we'll have a lot more to talk about with everyone um, in early 2022. So that's only a couple months away. Oh my goodness, 22 is almost Will there be another meeting for their redesign? Oh, we will have lots of meetings with lots of people. Okay, great. We'll definitely invite more Fenway folks to that meeting so we can have that great discussion. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, folks, I would just ask, uh, uh, out of courtesy, we can keep the uh, comments or questions to two minutes. Uh, we will not, we, I will be calling on a few more people that that, that had uh, raised their hands prior uh, to eight o'clock um, and, we will, and we will close there. So uh, in, in order, I'm going to go to Mr. Dave Gold and, and I'm going to ask to unmute you now. Mr. Gold, I've just asked to unmute you. 
Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Hi, I just got off at the Kendall Green stop. Um, thank you for staying on so long. So um, people have been talking about service every six minutes and partial service. I just got off at Kendall Green because there's no service at all at Silver Hill Station where I bought my house. Our community has been completely stranded. The next nearest commuter rail stop is two miles from Silver Hill, which is much more than a third of a mile threshold that you mentioned. The closure of Silver Hill Station is forcing us into our cars as we're trying to commute into our jobs in Boston. Resuming service at Silver Hill is consistent with the service change goals that you've mentioned, preserving access for our community, providing sufficient service for riders who are returning to in-person work. Commuters have been using the Silver Hill Station Mr. Gold? Hello? Mr. Gold, you cut off. I, I couldn't hear you. Reopen the Silver Hill Station, please. Thank you. I believe the gist of your of your comment is that uh, you were outside of that uh, one third uh, parameter that we've spoken about, and that your the the next stop is about two and a half miles away, uh, and it's causing issues uh, on being able to commute into downtown. And you're requesting that we return that we open up back Silver Hill Station. Did I did I catch that? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear can you. you hear that, me? Okay. That, yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, um, that's I, essentially I, right. I... Go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's consistent with your goals to preserve access for our community and provide sufficient service for riders who are returning to in-person work to reopen and stop. Commuter rails, uh, uh, commuters have been using the Silver Hill Station since 1844. Homeowners in the Silver Hill community invested in our property in reliance on there being commuter rail service. Construction is now underway on a multi-unit 40B affordable housing project that's 1,000 feet from the Silver Hill Station. And that project was permitted in reliance on there being commuter rail service. So please reopen the Silver Hill Station. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Gold. Uh, I believe we've spoken to several folks. I think we might have spoken in the past. Um, and I will take the, these comments back to our commuter rail team. Um, I will note that right now uh, the, the changes that we're speaking about um, are uh, germane to the bus subway. Um, uh, and uh, the commuter rail is not part of these winter schedule changes, uh, but this is uh, as that schedule um, gets looked at uh, for the next change, I will take those comments back. Okay, please reopen the station as soon as you can. Duly noted. Uh, next, uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Jacob Deck uh, to unmute, Mr. Deck. Hello, um, can everybody hear me? We can. Perfect. Um, I guess um, my question is how, uh, it's about the, the trackless trolley routes in out of the Harvard uh, busway and the, the Cambridge car house. Um, other cities, including Seattle, that have substituted non-trolley bus non-trolley buses for trackless trolleys have experienced less reliable service and they need more operator hours to provide the same level of service. Um, the T is really facing a shortage of operator hours right now. So I guess the question is why in the immediate term, um, we've heard comments that trolley bus service could end as soon as this winter, um, is the T pursuing a mode that creates worse service for more operator hours. So, so you're speaking about the North Cambridge uh, uh, projects over uh, Mount Vernon, is that Mr. Deck? Hello? I think I can jump in, um, or do you wanna take this again? I'll take a quick step first here, um, cause I think some of our spring service plans are still up in the air. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, Melissa and, and I represent the service planning team. I don't think we're, we're well equipped to talk through the specifics okay. of the fleet and facility plan, but I think specifically if there's been any discussions about um, stopping trackless trolley service on Mount Auburn streets, yep. 
um, is, is due to actual road work and project work uh, led by the cities or utilities. Um, that is major important work, but essentially prevents us from running the trackless trawlers at the same time. And I know, Angel, you've been liaising closely on these two. Yep. Um, uh, that's a great question, Mr. Deck. Um, you know, I, we, we, did a, we, weren't, we were part of a public meeting uh, with several elected officials in late August on this, and we had uh, subsequent conversations. As Kat put it, there are major projects that are happening in that area that are in convoluence of events. Um, that essentially uh, 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 have um, uh, forced the MBTA in, a way, in one way or another to, to reevaluate um, the North Cambridge garage and the future of that. We have a pretty a very comprehensive um, uh, bus uh, fleet facility um, uh, program that we're currently uh, un that's currently underway to uh, to make the system um, uh, 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 with clean energy. Um, and one of our solutions is these uh, these trackless trolleys. Right now, they're bumping up against they're about 17 years old, so they're they're past their useful life. Uh, and as uh, the MBTA has made an organizational decision uh, to essentially uh, move to a BEB style vehicle to have a more homogenous fleet, and that provides a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, good continuity for the organization. Uh, it is an equitable thing to do because right now the trackless trolleys that are there um, don't. Uh, if we have to, if if there's if there's um, if there's an issue on the over at Catenary, we then have to pull bus service from other areas. So um, uh, on Sundays we're 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 essentially already providing um, hybrid vehicles in that area, um, uh, uh, and so uh, that is um, that is part of the reason why the MBTA is moving forward with that, but. Uh, again, I would encourage you to take a look at our BEB facility uh, program that's on our website. We have a pretty comprehensive program, and it speaks into much greater detail um, around that. And again, if there are specific questions that you'd like for me to answer, I would encourage you to email us at uh, mbtaengagement.com and our team, um, and I'm happy to follow up with you individually and provide you with those details. Great. Uh, if thanks. If I could add one more point, um, we had previously thought that some of the other roadway construction projects were going to be underway. That's why there had been some discussion about uh, replacement with hybrid buses as early as December. At this point, we've constructed the December schedules, assuming that uh, the ETBs would continue to operate through uh, at least the winter. Uh, so I just wanted to flag that um, for the discussion. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, just brief note, I did look at the documents that were posted on your website about ETBs. Uh, your math is funny, and a bunch of advocacy organizations also say your math is funny. Duly noted, and again, I'm happy to, if you send an email out, I'm happy to get in, uh, the details with you about that. Uh, we have two more. Uh, next, I've asked to unmute uh, number uh, one last uh, digits on this on the number one nine eight nine. You've been unmuted. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, so I actually asked the question about the seven bus, and um, mm -hmm. I just wanted a little bit more detail. I mean, I understand that ridership is not has not returned to what it was pre-pandemic, um, but every single week when I've gone into work, um, and I do have the flexibility to not go in every day, which I have not been because of the difficulty with the bus. Um, I've had buses go right by me in the morning that are too full to um, pick me up. And last week, leaving South Station, I waited for over 40 minutes for a bus to go home. Um, it's just entirely unacceptable. And it, especially in um, the bus stops in South Boston don't have any sort of covers. There's no sort of shelters. You're asking people to wait out in the cold for longer periods of time as you drop schedules. And it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg scenario. Um, my office and a lot of people that I know's office provides the flexibility to work from home if they want to um, right now. And why would you go back in if you're going to wait for 40 minutes? Um, but if you guys are cutting schedules because people are making these decisions because the schedule is so bad, it's just a self-fulfilling downward spiral. Um, from our perspective, I, Kat, can I take a quick stab at this? Um, I would just, I would just note that this is. I want to emphasize, as Kat and Melissa have emphasized before, 
these changes are because of a national pattern that we've seen where, where you know, where there's a shortage of drivers. This is not something that the MBTA wants to be doing at this moment. Our FY22 uh, budget calls for fully funding 100% uh, of service, and, um, and we are doing everything that we can, leaving no stone unturned to, to bring that service back. So this isn't something that we want to be doing. Um, you know, and, and we understand, again, we understand the frustration that certain people are feeling about it. But again, this is not something that the MBTA wants to be currently doing. Um, I would it's... ask, are you guys working with like the city at least? I mean, this current city administration is advocating for less parking with new developments with the um, thought process that there's going to be more of a, the ability to have people taking public transport. It's going to be more of a carless city, but the unreliability or the lack of reliability of the MBTA makes that kind of a non-starter for many people. Mm -hmm. I, I would tell you that we have close conversations with the city. We meet bi-weekly and at, at an executive level and then in other departments, we have a very close working relationship with the city of Boston. And that has not changed with the new administration at all. It's been like that with previous administrations and we'll continue to work in concert with our friends over in the city um, moving forward as we always have. I guess that doesn't answer the question. The city is pushing for less, with new developments, less car parking spaces with mm -hmm. the idea that people will be able to rely on the MBTA. What are they doing to assist the reliability issues? Because that's what, if we're supposed to be a carless city and I'm supposed to not have a car living here, I should be able to rely on the seven bus, which by the way, doesn't run on Sundays, which is in of itself kind of an absurd concept and is never run on Sundays. Like those types of things are an issue for residents as there's less and less um, parking spaces built with new developments. And I mean, the seven goes right by the new giant um, development that's going to be taking place on L Street at the old power station. So I, I can take this and I think, and it's not just the seven, it's also all routes and, and in the system. And I think I'd go back to comments we've made before about where we are right now in the winter. I think that's, we're in a moment in time, right? And eventually we will, we as an agency and as a nation need to figure out bus operator hiring and CDL hiring. That's the moment of time. But looking to the future, I think to what we are saying, there's two key things that will help really in what we call bus transformation or the better bus project. And really everything that's going on with our rail transformation investments and orange line transformation investments, investing billions of dollars into our system to ensure that it is safe, reliable and modern. For bus specifically, two big changes. One, as Melissa said, network redesign. Um, Boston's changed a lot in the past hundred years. In many ways, our bus network hasn't. And taking a blank sheet approach and saying, what makes sense so that we're really matching the travel patterns of the region? And so again, really encourage everyone to come join those conversations. And there'll be many conversations starting in 2022. As part of that map though, um, and that plan, there'll be a discussion on um, the calling out everywhere that we think we should be running really high frequency bus service. And I'll go back to what I was saying, high frequency bus service is really only ever gonna be enabled by um, uh, really good transit priority and really well enforced transit priority. So there's a lot of efforts underway. And like Angel said, we work very, very closely with the Boston Transportation Department. We work very, very closely with the planning and transportation departments in other cities. And I think having that strategic plan about what this system should look like, the resources required to deliver it, and where we need to think about the allocation of street space. That's, that's I think, really how we transform the bus network and the whole system to make sure it's what our region needs for public transit. Um, so I think that's what we're talking about now, I think really important for how we get the winter service, but longer term, really encourage everyone to join conversations, both about transit priority and about network redesign, because that's where we'll see the bus transformation. And I would say on the bus transformation piece, we're very, working very closely with them and other organizations on that. So, and again, encourage you to take a look at our website when it comes to the uh, reimagining of our bus network. Okay, thank you. I mean, it, it's great to see something in the future, but it kind of turns you off from using the MBTA if it's so unreliable in the present. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last, I'm going to call on Clyde Kelly, and I'm going to ask to unmute you. Hi, I'm sorry. Um, thank you guys for saying, and I apologize. I did join this meeting late. 
I'm kind of echoing the color just previously that was speaking because I do live in Southie and I'm not that close to the red line on Broadway or um, anywhere. Like I have to walk like a mile and a half to get to any like subway, but where I live, there are the buses that come by the seven, the 11, the nine. Um, and in previous, before COVID, again, as the poly has been stated, those buses are always packed and they will drive by you when they're full. And my concern is the same as the caller as well, that um, with the unreliability of it and the fact that there's a lot more people moving into the city and there's a lot more construction of going up of like multiple units, the fact that you guys are not, I know this isn't your choice to do this, but the fact that the is going to be more limited is going to really drastically cause, I think, a lot of disruption of the growth in this community. Um, and I'm just curious, what is it that the drivers get paid is what the shortage that's causing the drivers not being able to be hired to keep these buses running on a timely schedule and in a schedule on the times that people are using them? Thank you for uh, for the comment on that. Uh, as far as what, what the driver pay is, I would encourage you to take a look at those specifics are listed on, on mbta.com slash careers. It goes over all of our entire benefits package um, and what the starting pay is during training and subsequently after that. And I would okay. also be remiss if I didn't mention that, as Kat mentioned earlier, um, we are in the midst of, of contract negotiations um, and obviously we can't get into details, uh, but we're, as I said earlier, we're exploring a vast amount of options, uh, but those things are being collectively bargained um, with our union, and we can't get into specifics about that. I'm curious, like, the way that this, the way, I know, like, the driver shortage might be an issue, but how is this data being gathered on the buses? Because as I've taken the buses, there's been times that I've gotten on the bus, and the, if it's by, like, you tapping your your and your pass, it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. um, so like the data collection on trying to analyze the, the timing of why the times that it seems like they're cutting down on when the buses are supposed to be coming or when I feel like are what is the most valuable timeframes for it to be in service. Yeah, I just wanted to flag, that's a great question. And we hear that a lot. Um, or sometimes we'll hear that folks might get waved on by an operator or that they they don't see somebody in front of them tap and they feel like that's undercounting. But actually we don't use the, the fare box data when we're um, doing our ridership counts. We're using what we call automated passenger counters. Um, it's an infrared device that's mounted at both the front and the rear doors. So uh, we can count whether people are um, boarding or alighting and whether they use the front door or the back door. Uh, and it's also great for getting us uh, load information uh, for understanding where those most crowded stops are. Um, they're on um, not quite all of the buses in our fleet, but a very great many and a growing number because all of our new buses are gonna have those counters on them. So it's it's not the fare box, I just wanted to repeat that. Oh, that's interesting. And, and again, like I wasn't on the call earlier, I joined late, so I wasn't aware if that was something that was communicated. Um, but I do, you know, obviously have concerns because people live in the city because they want to depend on the like the ability of getting on our commuter and our MBTA and people some we, we pay monthly passes to get a to have this service and when it's not something that's reliable it, it's going to deter a lot of us from using it and I know you've mentioned already like you're working on that reality that a reliability sorry you're working on that but in the meantime you've got a lot of people in this area that are in the South Boston, like deeper in the areas that rely on that transportation with the buses. And it's really hard as it is already to find parking if you have a car and then to drive it if you needed to into your city to park. It's also really expensive. It's just, it's like a, it's just, it's just an issue that's gonna continue to perpetuate by not having a reliability of the, the buses system that we have depended on. and why we moved knowing that those are what we have to get into our jobs. Thank you, very much appreciated. Uh, that is uh, what we have for questions tonight. We wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening and for sharing your comments and concerns. 
Uh, there are many other opportunities at the MBTA to, to, to share your feedback with us, uh, including our monthly customer opinion panel survey and upcoming public meetings. Uh, a recording of tonight's meeting will be posted online within the next few days. Uh, and again, uh, I would encourage folks, if you have additional questions or comments, that those can be submitted to our community engagement team at publicengagement at mbta.com. Again, we thank you everyone for joining us uh, and, being, and bringing us some thoughtful comments, and we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Thank you, guys. Thanks all. Have a great night. Thank you.